Hey everyone, welcome to the second episode of the Nifty 50 series. In today's video, we are going to focus on the steel sector and do a comprehensive analysis of JSW Steel Limited, which is one of the largest steel manufacturing companies in India. Keep in mind that this video is not at all an investment recommendation and it is only for educational purposes. If you are new here, then do consider supporting this channel by smashing that subscribe button. So let's start off by first taking an overview of the steel industry as a whole. Steel, as we all know, holds great significance towards the development of a country's infrastructure, roads and railway network, industrial machinery, and even the automobile sector. In 2023, the global crude steel production stood at 1,888 million tons, out of which 54%, that is 1,019 million tons, was produced by China, thereby making it the largest producer of crude steel in the world. On the second spot was India, which manufactured 140 million tons of crude steel, thereby contributing 7.4% to the global crude steel production. Between January and September 2024, the global crude steel production fell by 1.9%, majorly owing to the subdued demand for steel in China, where the real estate sector is struggling. As far as the steel industry in India is concerned, crude steel production grew by 11.8% in FY24 and it is expected to continue to grow by 10% in the next few years as well. This high domestic growth can be owed to government initiatives such as smart cities, affordable housing for all, Gati Shakti plan and the national infrastructure pipeline that focuses on energy transition, road connectivity, railway network expansion and more. Since India is still in the transitioning phase of becoming a developed nation, there is going to be sustained periods of high steel demand that outpaces the country's GDP growth rate. Why I say this is because historically, the development trajectory of nations like Germany, Japan, South Korea and China also had sustained periods of high steel demand. Now one thing that differentiates the steel industry from other industries such as FMCG or pharma is that the steel industry is cyclical in nature. What it means is that there are phases of high demand and high steel prices when these steel manufacturing firms make a lot of money and there are phases of low demand and low steel prices where these steel manufacturing firms struggle to generate profits. For example, if you take a look at Tata Steel's share price, then you can very clearly see the impact of cyclicity in this sector. The thing is that construction, infrastructure, automobiles and capital goods are all sensitive to economic fluctuations and so during economic downturns, the demand for steel drops and that directly affects the revenue and profitability of the steel manufacturing firms. So this makes it all the more important to identify when to enter in a steel stock and when to exit. Now coming to the sustainability aspect of the steel industry, one should know that steel manufacturing is one of the largest contributors to global CO2 emissions. In India, the steel industry is responsible for 12% of the total carbon emissions in the country. In the currently used method of steel making, where blast furnaces and basic oxygen furnaces are used to transform iron ore into steel, the entire process results in a large amount of carbon emissions and wastewater that needs to be treated before discharge. At the same time, the operations of the steel plant are powered by fossil fuel based energy which further contributes to CO2 emissions. Clearly, this method is not sustainable in the long term and so the steel industry needs to come up with newer technologies to transform the steel making processes such that the CO2 emissions can be reduced and more of renewable energy can be used to power the steel plants. Now before we dive deeper and try to understand the dynamics of the steel industry in India, you must know the difference between crude steel and finished steel. So crude steel is basically the raw output from the steel making process and it needs further processing to be ready for use in different applications. Finished steel on the other hand is the final product made by shaping and treating crude steel into usable forms like sheets, rods or pipes. So finished steel is ready for use in industries such as construction, automotive, renewable energy, transportation and even nuclear power plants. At the moment, India is currently a net importer of finished steel. Even in FY25, finished steel exports will not witness a substantial increase that is required to make India a net exporter. The reason for this is that Indian finished steel exporters are facing direct competition from Chinese mills that supply the same or higher quality steel at much cheaper rates in export destinations such as Europe, Middle East and Southeast Asia. Talking of the domestic scene, India's finished steel consumption stood at 138.5 million tons in FY24 which makes it the second largest consumer of steel just after China. The domestic demand for steel will only be higher in the 
coming years. And so India aims to increase the crude steel production capacity from 143.6 million tons to 255 million tons by 2030-31. The increased capacity would help achieve 230 million tons of finished steel at 85% utilization. Now pay close attention as I'm going to address the technological lag that exists in the steel industry in India. See, Indian steel manufacturing firms currently use the traditional blast furnaces to produce steel. In this method, the major raw materials used are coking coal, iron ore and limestone. The coking coal is heated in the absence of oxygen in coke ovens in order to remove impurities such as moisture, volatile matter and gases. This process leaves behind a carbon rich material called coke which is hard, porous and capable of withstanding very high temperatures. Coming to iron ore, post its extraction from mines, it is grinded and then sorted using magnetic separation. Post that, the grinded matter is rolled into small uniform pallets using binders like bentonite. When the pallets are ready, they are put into the blast furnace along with coke and limestone. The blast furnace is then heated at temperatures exceeding 1600 degrees Celsius. This converts the pallets into molten iron and all the impurities react with the limestone to create a slag which floats on top of the molten iron. This slag is easily removed from the top and the molten iron is transferred into a basic oxygen furnace wherein pure oxygen is injected at a very high pressure. The oxygen reacts with carbon and other impurities and oxidizes all the unwanted elements such as carbon, silicon, phosphorus, etc. This process leaves behind molten steel with desired carbon content, which is then poured into a ladle so that alloying elements such as chromium, nickel or manganese can be added for specific properties. In this traditional method of steel making, a large amount of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide is released, which is really harmful for the environment. Now that you understand the traditional method of steel making, let me introduce you to a more environment friendly method of steel making, which uses green hydrogen and electric arc furnaces to transform iron ore into steel. This method is usually called hydrogen-based direct reduction. Under this method, the iron ore is put into a shaft furnace and instead of coke, green hydrogen is injected at high temperatures as a reducing agent. This method also results in molten iron, but the byproduct in this case is H2O or water vapor instead of carbon dioxide. Furthermore, the molten iron is poured into an electric arc furnace instead of a basic oxygen furnace. Then graphite electrodes are lowered into the furnace and electric arcs are generated between the electrodes. These electric arcs can easily reach temperatures of 3000 degrees Celsius, which is sufficient to keep steel in the melted state. Then again, lime is added in the furnace, which helps to remove the impurities in the form of a floating slag. Now, similar to the traditional method, once the desired composition is achieved for the steel, alloys are added for specific properties. Even in the case of electric arc furnaces, there is emission of carbon monoxide, but it is much lower when compared to traditional blast furnaces. Now, one should note that the steel produced using this method would be called green steel only if the operations of the plant, including electric arc furnaces, are powered by renewable energy and that the hydrogen used is produced using electrolysis via renewable energy. But things are not as simple as they sound. There are literally several challenges for the Indian steel manufacturing firms to adopt this newer technology. First of all, there is a lack of availability of green hydrogen and there is a very high upfront cost to set up green hydrogen plants that can serve large-scale steel manufacturing operations. The development of hydrogen infrastructure in the country will take several years for fruition. Moreover, there is insufficient renewable energy capacity to reliably support the large-scale energy needs of a steel manufacturing plant or for the manufacturing of hydrogen on a large scale. Therefore, there is heavy reliance on coking coal for reduction of iron ore using blast furnaces. India literally has an abundant amount of coal and so powering the steel plant operations through the cheaply available coal-based energy makes much more economical sense. Lastly, the transition to newer technologies such as electric arc furnaces requires new equipment, infrastructure, technology development, and skilled workforce. For the initial few years, the transition would increase the production cost of steel for the domestic steel manufacturing firms and it would therefore make them less competitive in the international market. Now that you are well acquainted with the dynamics of the steel industry in India, let's head to the last part of this video where we analyze JSW Steel Limited, which is one of the largest steel manufacturing companies in India. JSW Steel Limited, which started its journey in 1982, currently has a crude steel production capacity of 35 million tons 
per annum. Mr. Sajjan Sindal, in his latest interview with Money Control, mentioned that by 2030-31, JSW Steel expects its crude steel production capacity to reach 50 million tons per annum. In FY2425, the company's expected capex for capacity expansion is around 20,000 crores. The company majorly has seven manufacturing facilities, out of which the Vijayanagar facility is India's largest single location steel plant. The major products manufactured in these facilities are hot and cold roll steel, galvanized steel, electrical steel, color coated steel, tin plate, TMT bars, wired rods, and special alloyed steel. These products are used for solar mounting structures, expressways, metro projects, railway wagons, reinforcement and crash parts for passenger vehicles oil and gas valves, and many other applications. Now, the ability of JSW to scale further would depend on whether the company has enough accessibility to key raw materials such as iron ore, coking coal, etc. As per the company's annual report, the company has 24 captive iron ore mines and 3 captive coking coal mines. Apart from this, JSW Steel Limited has also acquired Minasta Rabuboy mine in Mozambique to secure high-quality coking coal supply. It is said that this mine has more than 800 million tons of coking coal reserves and if the Ministry of Mineral Resources and Energy in Mozambique approves this acquisition, then JSW Steel Limited will have the best of the both worlds, that is enough iron ore availability domestically and enough high quality coking coal which it can import from Mozambique. Now we know that steel manufacturing firms incur huge costs towards iron ore logistics and that really affects the bottom line of the companies. To combat this, JSW Steel Limited is developing a 302 km slurry pipeline in Odisha to transport iron ore in an environment-friendly way from the mines to the nearest port. This project, which is slated for commissioning in FY2627, will not only help JSW Steel Limited in transporting large volumes of iron ore at much cheaper rates when compared to transporting it through rail, but will also help in reducing carbon emissions due to the underground pipeline system. Since we are talking of carbon emissions, JSW Steel Limited is targeting to become net neutral in carbon emissions for all the operations under direct control by 2050, much ahead of India's commitment to the world by 2070. To reduce carbon emissions, the company plans to invest $1 billion across its operations. What's interesting is that JSW Steel Limited is the first steel company globally to raise $500 million in US dollar denominated sustainability linked bonds. JSW actually doesn't see decarbonization as a cost but it sees decarbonization as an opportunity for significant growth in the coming decades. Mr. Sajjan Jindal mentions in his message in the annual report that he sees multi-decadal themes playing out for steel demand across key sectors such as infrastructure, real estate, transportation, and energy transition. Now, one of the immediate risks that the company sees for exports is the cross-border adjustment mechanism, which is nothing but a new carbon tariff by the European Union that puts a price on carbon emitted during the production of certain carbon-intensive goods that enter the EU. It is expected that even other steel export destinations may adopt such carbon tariff regimes. To combat this, JSW Steel Limited plans to establish a green steel manufacturing facility with a capacity of 2 million tons per annum that is expandable to 4 million tons per annum in order to cater to the global customers that seek green steel. The technology the company is exploring for this is green hydrogen and CCUS technology, which is carbon capture, utilization, and storage technology. Additionally, JSW has also joined the India H2 Alliance, which is an industry coalition focused on bringing down the production cost of hydrogen and building a local hydrogen supply chain. Even though the global demand for steel has declined recently, the interest rate cuts happening in major nations is expected to slowly support the consumption of steel and the overall economic activity. At the same time, light weighting of EVs via advanced high strength steel, packaging through tin plate, energy efficiency through electrical steel, and sustainable roofing solutions are all going to aid in creating new demand for the steel industry. For JSW Steel Limited, the domestic sales accounts for 86% of the revenue and the exports form only 14% of the revenue. This implies that JSW is not very over dependent on exports for growth. JSW Steel has also made a technical collaboration with JFE Steel Corporation Japan, which would help it to improve energy efficiency to reduce costs and aid in establishing quality systems for new age product developments. 
If we look at the stock prices of major steel companies, then 2025 seems to be the year where stock prices may bottom out and that may be the right time to buy quality steel stocks. The fall of quarterly sales and net profit for JSW Steel shows that currently there is a downward trend as a whole, even though the demand from some of the segments such as solar, tin plate or appliances may have witnessed an increase. I personally will be waiting for another quarter or two in order to take any position in this sector. Another factor that makes me confident on JSW Steel's growth is their target of reaching a crude steel production capacity of 42 million tons by 2027 and 50 million tons by 2030. Moreover, the company is planning to increase its profitability by focusing on downstream capacities that manufacture products such as low relaxation, pre-stressed concrete strand, cold rolled steel and premium tin plate packaging products. If one were to see the company's balance sheet, then the company's long-term borrowings have increased which may seem like a concern. But for capital intensive companies, using debt to scale production capacities is quite normal. One thing that could bother you as an investor is that the increased debt comes with an increased interest cost of 3%. For JSW Steel Limited, the net debt to equity is 1.04 which is quite manageable seeing the cash reserves as well as its ability to raise funds from financial institutions and banks both domestically and internationally. Also, for a capital intensive business, it is really important to know about the return on capital employed to see how efficiently the company is using its capital that is both debt and equity to generate profits. For JSW Steel, the return on capital employed is 13.3%, which is higher than its peers such as Tata Steel and Steel Authority of India. This signifies that JSW Steel is more efficient in using the available resources. To conclude, as the steel industry is cyclical in nature, one should understand that timing of entry and exit in steel stocks would highly influence the returns you make. For JSW Steel, I feel that the company is gearing up for decarbonization and green steel demand using strategic levers such as energy transition to renewable energy, improved raw material quality, and commercial deployment of hydrogen for steel making. I personally feel that 2025 may bring in a buying opportunity for investors in order to profit from the next cycle. Keep in mind that this video is not at all an investment recommendation and you should do your own research before making making any investment. Thank you so much for watching, like the video, hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for my next video.